kids are dismissed to kids' church. What an awesome sound. Enjoy, kids. I'm getting a little feedback. Test. Test, test. That's better. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Do you hear a ring at all, or is that just my head? No ring? It's just my head? Okay. It's going to be one of those days. Emma to Sierra. She left. Did she leave? Sierra? Yeah, okay, good. Um, not good that she left, sorry. I just wanted to apologize for clapping prematurely for the band. I was super excited back there and uh, ruined the ending. Uh, welcome to Waitsburg Christian Church. I'm Pastor Matt, if you're new here. Um, so we don't have any points today. It's, uh, it's one of those weird weeks where um, I'm just going to be surprised at what comes out of my mouth. And um, hopefully you are too. Not, not in a bad way, but in a good way. Speaking of this week, have you, have you ever been stressed out in your relationship with God? Like the, uh, the amount of effort that you put in, the work that you put in... Um, where you just feel like you, you're trying to get closer to God, but it's not working. Anyone else here with me? All right, okay, thank you for raising your hand. Go Hawks, by the way. I'm looking at you. Yeah. Tonight, uh, today I want to talk about the, uh, our strengths and our weaknesses. I'm talking about both today and how we need to look at them in a different light. And how if you've given your life to Christ, and if you're not there yet, hopefully this will be a motivating factor, how we're supposed to look at our strengths and our weaknesses. But I want to get right into the first two scriptures that we have. Um, I want to talk to you about my process throughout the week. Is when, when the Lord um, kind of nudges me with a sermon idea, I have seven different translations of the Bible that I set out in front of me on the desk, and I read uh, scriptures the same way through, through all of the, the Bibles that I have in my office. Um, it kind of puts more work on me than one hour a week, right, Noah? <laughs> the, uh, so maybe on those days where I have that many hours, it's an hour and a half I work a week. But today, usually I don't go into the message translation. Today I want to go into the message translation on some of the scriptures and then um, a different translation. But I want to show you some key points. Let's go to Philippians first. Now this is Paul talking. <clears throat> we spoke about Paul last week. Paul is, uh, is the artist formerly known as Saul where he went in and he, um, he tried to eliminate Christians. Men, women, uh, children. He wanted to get rid of all of them. He had an encounter with Jesus, and he became one of his greatest preachers for Jesus. And he writes this in Philippians, and that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs, those religious busybodies, all bark, all bark and no bite. All they're interested in is appearances. Knife happy circumcisers. If this is your first time here and you're like, Dude, they're really getting it. I'm, uh, I'm going to switch mics. I'm, uh, wow, I'm on red now. So knife happy circumcisers, I call them. Don't know why I read it again. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at the, his, this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praises as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it. Even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials, 
You know my pedigree. He's talking about himself here. A legitimate birth, circumcised, once again, on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting Christians, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book, the very credentials these people are waving around as something special. This is amazing. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is in insignificant, dog dung. So there's one um, ancient scholar that said, this is the closest that you get to swearing in the Bible. Because he means something more than just dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and, em and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in the suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. Go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. Can we back up one slide? I want to hit on this point. I wanted to, right before that it says, I wanted to be embraced. I want to embrace him and be embraced by him. He's essentially saying, I want to hug Jesus as he hugs me. So all these strengths that I'm telling you about, they relate to dog dung compared to what I have in Christ. And all I'm going to throw them all away so that I can hug Jesus and he can hug me. So that's the strengths that he's talking about. What about the weaknesses? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, <clears throat> excuse me, and so I wouldn't get a big head I was given the gift of a handicap. Some, in some translations you'll know as a thorn in the side. Gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angels did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that. And then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride and with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, oppositions, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. What I love about this is that on the strength side, Paul is saying the biggest hurdle, the biggest obstacle that I have from hugging Jesus and him hugging me is my strengths, my accomplishments, my achievements. And then he's talking about his weaknesses and he's saying, those I thought kept me from Jesus, but in fact it pulled me to my knees and it made me embrace Jesus even more. So today I want to talk about the, the two obstacles that keep us from embracing Jesus, from hugging Jesus. And I want that picture in your mind as we talk of, of you hugging Jesus and him hugging you back. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you give me words today. But there's times I may not know where I'm going, but you do. I pray you take over, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you for being in this church, these communities, and uh, just being you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So there was a guy that I, I will always remember that um, taught at a church I went to when I was little. I, I don't remember his name, but I remember his body hair. And um, true story. He'd be teaching in one of the small classrooms that we had. And he was, he was bald on top, but he had this hair like coming out from his back that like wrapped up to his head. It was, it was just a, an amazing sight to see. <laughs> and I remember just, I, I couldn't stop focusing on this. And, and I'm trying to be, you know, a good steward for the Lord and, and serve the Lord, but I found myself making fun of his bald head. And then uh, I got married with a full head of hair and <laughs> I believe God was like, hey, you remember that time where you kept making fun of this guy with the, with the back hair that almost made him look like he had hair on his head, but he was bald? Well, here's the thorn in your side that you're going to have now. I remember my daughter, the first time that I realized that I was going bald is we were in a swimming pool, and she said, Dad, you're going bald. You're losing your hair. She was just little, so I, it was a public pool. I just took her out right there and spanked her publicly. <laughs> Kidding, don't get offended, I didn't do that. But I always remember this guy because um, I was a talker, shocker. I talked to everyone, I was a distraction. Finally, he pulled me away, he pulled me aside one time and he said, Matt, what's your favorite, he called me Matthew, some of you call me Matthew. Um, but he called me Matthew and I knew, I was like, okay, what's going on? He said, what's your favorite Bible verse? And I said the only one I knew, which was Jesus wept, because it was the first, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. So it came right out, Jesus wept. And he said, really? I said, yeah. He said, okay, if you want that. And he said, do you know what my favorite verse is? And he said, my favorite verse is, G or God helps those who help themselves. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, I don't remember that, but I went home and kids, this was before you could just Google something. I had to actually open the Bible and start reading and say, where is this in the Bible? And I couldn't find it. And I was like, I, that's a really good one. I want that one. God helps those who help themselves. So I asked my dad and he starts laughing. I didn't understand until he told me that that's nowhere in the Bible. Now, some of you may be shocked and you're like, well, my grandma told me that was, that was her favorite verse, and I'm going to take the note. That's nowhere in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. It's nowhere in there. Now, let's answer that question. Does God help those who help themselves? The answer, God helps everybody. But does God help those who help themselves? Yes, but it's going to be a whole lot harder on that person. What I love about this, this scripture, is that Paul gives, Paul gives his accomplishments that could beat out anybody. He stands at the best of the best with his accomplishments, and he lays them all out for us. And what he says is, twice I threw it in the trash. All these accomplishments, all these achievements, I threw it away in the trash. They meant nothing to me, dog dung, waste, I'm over it, it doesn't define me. And the reason is because I'm embracing, with, with those in my hand, I can't embrace Jesus like he embraces me. Some of you know this, but my favorite story in the Bible is Luke 15, the prodigal son. I've given multiple versions, um, sermons on this, but I love this, where, you have a wayward son who left, and as he's coming back, the father sees him, and he runs at him, and he embraces him. And what I love about this and, and is that it shows a picture of God, is that, that God is supposed to be the father in this picture. And he embraces him and kissing him. Who is God? What is God like? God's a hugger. Do you ever have these, um, does anyone not like hugs? Can you raise your hand so I don't do what I did last year? <laughs> Jess, I don't know, Jess. Um, so like two years ago, I, I realized I hug everybody. If I just meet them, I hug them. But there was a lady that came into church, and I've hugged her before. And I thought everything was cool. 
And I go to hug her, and she puts a hand right in my chest and says, no, really loud. And I'm like, now I'm gun shy. So if I, if I don't hug you, just know that I would like to. I just don't know how you're going to react, and I'm not going to be put in that situation again. But there's some people like uh, the, our, our old church. If you, if you had the youth there and they gave a, 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 a full hug, you're, you're gone. See you later. You have to give the, the side hug. How many of you know about the side hug? You're like, hey, hey, pal, everything's good. Um, I'm, I'm a full hugger. Who is God? God's a hugger. God's a full hugger. And in this story, and what sucks is I'm about to give the conclusion at the beginning. This is going to be a problem later, but we'll get, we'll get on with it. But in this story, you have this father hugging and this, the son attempting to share why he shouldn't be hugged. The son talking about either his achievements or his lack of, of achievements. And over and over he says the words, I'm not worthy. Who is God? God's a hugger despite your strengths or your weaknesses. God's a hugger despite what you've done for him or what you think you don't deserve because of what you've done. And it talks about him ignoring the speech. I ignored the speech. When it comes to relationship with God through Jesus, it has nothing to do, church, with your strengths, achievements, or your failures. It has everything to do with the person, the being who's hugging you. This relationship, the standing with God. Here's the problem. When we receive the embrace of grace, we struggle because we want to explain what we've done. We want to explain, God, this is, this is what I've done for you or this is what I haven't done. And it's frustrating our walk with God because God will ignore that. God will ignore you bringing these strengths. Just as Paul said, I, have, I stand alone, the best of the best, and God, it, God ignores that speech. And he says, I threw it all away in the trash. In my opinion, the two greatest obstacles in embracing Jesus on levels that church we have yet to experience, the two biggest obstacles are our strengths and our weaknesses. And if we've accepted Jesus, we're supposed to relate to them in an entirely different way. I love Paul saying this, this message translation it puts it in a way that, that it's given what's a normal response to strength? This, is, this may be an easy, this, this isn't a trick question. What's our normal response to our strengths? We're proud of them. You know, that's what I do. It, it's the thing that people say, wow. And you're like, I know. Those are our strengths. And in church, what I want you to do is I want you to maximize those strengths. I want you to work on those strengths. I want you to be able to fine-tune these strengths. And what do we do with our weakness? We're embarrassed by it. We want to hide it. We want to show our strengths and maximize our strengths, but we want to hide our weaknesses because we, we feel like that's keeping us from God or from other people, and we want to hide that away and not talk about it. This has to be changed or you'll be perpetually frustrated in your walk with God. This has to change. The way that you look at your strengths of putting them up there and saying, yes, this is what I am and I don't want you to look behind here. This has to change. And the, the two points, if you want to call them that, that I want to talk about, I want to talk about strengths and weaknesses, but I want to hit strengths first. How do we relate to our strengths? What I love is that Paul calls them giftings. He calls them giftings, not, not his strengths, but it, he turns from talking about his strengths, using that word, and then he changes it to, these are the gifts that I've been given. How many of you talk about your strengths as gifts? Because here's what we do. And by the way, I love this mug. Liz, Liz just got me this mug, and it is so true. It says, careful or you'll end up in my next sermon. 
Yes. And my wife didn't know that she agreed to be in every sermon by marrying me. But what do we do with our what do we do with our strengths? We come before God, but before we get to God, we get our we get our strengths. We we get them and we uh we come up to God and and we hug him, right? Like yeah, God, I know, I probably know why you're here. It's because of these. That's why you want to hug me. And, and I just want you to know that, that I'm, I'm going to do great things for you. Look, I've been, I've been working on these. I've been working really hard. And I just, want to, I just want to let you know that I'm here for your cause because of these. And this is what's, what's keeping us from a full embrace, a full hug of God, is us saying, God, I know that you want to hug me. Can you, can you just see all these strengths that, that I have right here? Our, I have a question, church. Are we helping God or are we following God? Some of you think that the Bible starts with, and in the beginning, God needed help. <laughs> in the beginning was God and God alone. And that's where this frustration comes, where you're saying, God, I'm here to help. And he's saying, I, I never needed help. Well, God, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do? You, you gave me these, right? Yeah, you gave me these to help you. No, I gave you these because I love you. Because I want you. I don't need you. I want you. That, that's where we get to the, uh, and if you've been in church a long time, you get the, the uh, preachers or the people who have been in church a long time that says, yep, yeah, and I led him to the Lord. You, what? Well, I led that person to the Lord. I got lost, literally, going from my house to the Walla Walla airport. I can no longer, I can no more lead somebody to the creator of the universe, one who opens his mouth and stars come out, than I can get to my house from, my, get from my house to the Walla Walla airport. Look, look at you, Jesus' little helpers. And, and I'm not trying to insult you. I want the perspective to change of are we, some of you say that, that Jesus, some of you think that Jesus says, help me instead of follow me. And we come bearing all these strengths that we have and we're saying, God, this is why you love me. That's an erroneous view of God. That is an erroneous view of God. If God needed help, Hear me now. If God needed help, He is not God. You are not the creator of everything. When before anything ever came, it was you and you alone. You cannot be the creator of the world. You cannot be God if you need help. That's a deficiency. He said, well, God, what, what do you want me to do with these? I want you to follow me. I don't need you. I want you. I chose you. And you can't get in there for a real hug if you, if you keep holding on to these strengths. I, I'm not saying to play this false humility game. And there's some people that do that. Well, well I'm not, I don't know. I'm just not a good speaker. I don't, I don't know. Matt, Matt you're, a, you're a good speaker. Well, I don't know. I don't know, you know, can you, can you tell me a little more? And we get this false humility and God is saying, you can't take credit for something that I gave you. And you can't be ashamed of something that I gave you. Church, it, uh, my word for 2020 is confidence. I am confident in the gifts that God has given me. Giftedness. Now, some, that, to other people, that may come across as, man, you're, you're cocky. No, I am confident in the gifts that God has given me. I believe that I am good at my job. And that bothers some people when I say that. 
is because God has given me a gift and I'm saying, God, this isn't a strength that's going to keep me from a full embrace from you, but this is a gift that's going to get me closer to you. We play these games of just, you know, it's not me, it's God. It's okay that you don't say that every time, church. I give you permission. Of, whenever someone gives you a compliment, or a compliment, you say, well, it's not me, it's God. They will see that in the way that you live. I have no problem when somebody says, man, that, you're good at what you do. And I say, thank you. God has given me this gift. And it's okay to think in your head, I am good at this. Why? Because God has given me this strength. But we, we treat these gifts like it's something that we've earned and we bring them to God. You know, God, it's my honor to serve you. I just love helping you out. God's saying, son, I don't need help. But God, why am I here? Because I love you. And I got lots for you to do. But it's because I chose for you to do it. I didn't need it, but I wanted it. This God that put the whole world in motion in the beginning was God and God alone. And he's saying, I wanted to do it with you. I want you to treat it like a gift. Just use them. Look at, uh, look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. How do we relate New way. Therefore, if anyone is new, is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Some of you know that I will never call myself an addict or an alcoholic because of this verse. That's gone. The old is gone. So some of you who have gone through hell and back and given your life to Christ, that does not define you. What defines you is this, is that you are new, a brand new creation. So how do we relate? If you're new, how do we relate to these strengths? He didn't give you these strengths so you put it on a shelf and say, I'm not worthy. I, I can't really do this, God. I know you've given me this gift, but I'm not worthy, so I'm going to put it on a shelf. We know you're not worthy. He knows I'm not worthy. But he's given us this gift. He's given us to use it. And as you use them, you'll gain confidence. We need more people who don't play games with their gift. Of either the false humility of, I don't know, I can't really use it. Or, look at me. Look at everything that I have done. Because of the, the strengths that I, have, I, I, I have in my life. But somebody asked me, do you ever get nervous before you speak? I don't get nervous, I get excited. Because I never know what's going to come out of my mouth, but I know it's going to be great. <laughs> Seriously, what sometimes when I'm, I'm in counseling, and this may be rubbing people wrong, but I want you to relate to your gift the way that I can relate to my gift. Sometimes I'm in counseling and I'll say something and, I'm, and I sit back and I'm like, that was pretty good. <laughs> relate to it in a way that brings glory to God of saying, God, that, wow, you brought that out of my mouth. My relationship with my gift is confidence. We have this, we need to have this attitude of gratefulness because church, it is powerful when you have an attitude of gratefulness. When you say, thank you, God, thank you for giving me this. Thank you for this gift because it, it shoots holes in this tiresome relationship with God. Why are we so stressed out with God sometimes? God, I've been using the strength over and over, and I can't get any closer. And I was that way this week. God, I, I can't. I've, you've given me this gift, but sometimes I feel like it's too much, Lord. The strength that I have, it's, I feel like I'm burning out. And when I say thank you, God, for this, thank you, and we get back to Luke 15 where it, where it says that, that he was embraced by grace. 
Some of you need to, to write this down and live by it in 2020. Embrace grace. I love it because he's embracing his son, and his son is supposed to get his speech out. When he's practicing it the whole way, he's saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, but if you just let me be like one of your hired servants, I'll work for you the rest of my life. I'm not worthy. And he's trying to get this out, and what's offensive it's almost offensive, is the father doesn't even let him get it out before he turns to his servant and he says, get the steaks, get the barbecue, get the jewelry, get the clothes, get the music, we're going to party because my son's home. He doesn't even get it out. Some of you are trying so hard to get out this speech of why you should be accepted by God or why you can't be accepted by God, and God is ignoring you. He's saying, that, no, we're going to party because my son is home. I felt this. I felt God say to me when I first got to Waitsburg. And, and when I say I felt God say, uh, speak to me, I want you to know at this church, if you're new here, I've said it before, but I've never audibly heard the voice of God. Because I believe that God knows that I'm already jumpy, and if I heard the audible voice of God, I would go to the bathroom all over myself. And I'm not trying to be crass, that's truth. Is I have never heard the audible voice of God. What God does is give me the old-fashioned nudge of this is the direction you need to go. But I heard this term of embrace grace. And I'm like, where, where do I go with that? And then I realize the prodigal son is that I'm just like that son. And grace comes to embrace me. I'm just like him because when grace, and this still happens after being a pastor for, I don't know, 10 years. I should probably figure that out and do the math, carry the one. I had nine years. I, uh, I still do this. When grace comes to embrace me, I'm... Jesus is trying to hug me and I'm fighting him off as I give a speech on, this is what I did this week, Lord. I let you down. Please don't hug me. Jesus, get off of me. Just let me get my speech out, please. And God is ignoring me. And he's saying, son, your strengths, your weaknesses are not keeping you from me. Embrace me. Hug me. God's not hugging you because he's so impressed with you. Someone needs to hear that. God's not hugging you because he's so impressed with you. Bless you. That was loud. Do you, we, we think that God's hugging us because he's impressed, and God won't hug us because he's not impressed with us. It, it, it's like we... I use this... It's like God's up in heaven and he's like, oh, hey, hey, angels, angels, get over here. You got to see this sermon. Did you hear that YouTube sermon? Wow. We, ha we have to record this and show it to everyone else. We I look at it, who, how many of you have kids in here? Do you remember when um, your kid, when they were little, would draw you a picture a picture where Michaela once handed me something and and I'm like wow oh wow wow Crystal come look come look at this Crystal hey what do you what do you think this is wow baby that is so good you know you really know how to draw airplanes and she's like dad that's a cow on a farm I really feel at times that God's up in heaven and he's the same way where he's like, man, you're so cute. I just love them so much. What they think they're, that what they're doing is just so amazing. This God who breathed galaxies is looking at what we've been doing and he's just like, I love them so much. Look at them. Look at them. It kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Of, is my strength really helping God? Am I helping him or am I following him? God just loves us. There's times where I'm like, God, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the best looking. I'm not the best speaker. 
but you chose me. You picked me. And I will hold you as long as you hold me. I don't know why, Lord. I don't know why this is it. But I will hold you as long as you hold me. And we're about to get to weaknesses, but some of you may say, where's hard work in all of this? Where's hard work? Let's look at, um, what did I write down? 1 Corinthians 15. This is also the message translation, but look at, look at this word. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. And I'm not about to let his grace go to waste. Haven't I worked hard? Some of you may be saying, there it is. Haven't I worked hard trying to do more than any of the others? Even though my work didn't amount to all that much, it was God giving me the work to do, God giving me the energy to do it. So whether you heard it from me or from those others, it's all the same. We spoke God's truth, and you entrusted your lives. Let's go back to the uh, 10. Look at what this says. Even though my work didn't amount to all that much, it was God giving me the work to do and God giving me the energy to do it. So your hard work, you can't even take credit for. He's saying, yeah, I worked hard, but it was actually that God gave me the work and he got, God gave me the passion to do it. So it doesn't amount to much because God did everything. God will give you passion for the work that he's called you to do. He'll give you favor through it and grace in it. I told God a long time ago, God, you want me to raise a family, take on my nephew, preach, at least one to two times a week, counsel. You want me to sweet Jesus? You really want me to do that? Okay. But God, I'm, I'm asking you to give me the messages. I'm asking you to give me the words to counsel. I'm asking you. You've given me the hard work, Lord. I'm asking that you continue giving me the passion for it. That's the relationship that I have with God. Is I'm saying, you, God, you've given me this hard work. And Lord, if this is what you want me to do, that's my story. And this will be this church's story from here on out. Is that God will give us the hard work to do, but he will give us the passion to do it. And he will give us the open doors to do it. So I'm going to close. I know we're going. I'm going to close with, what, how do we relate to our weaknesses? Just as we relate to our strengths as gifts, I want to show you how you relate to your weaknesses as gifts as well. What are you talking about? You're, you're, you want us to relate to our weaknesses as a gift. Yes, I want you to em fully embrace grace. Because church, we, we all, we all, we all have weaknesses. Every one of us has weaknesses. And there will be no true progress in this church, in this community, until we admit that we all have a problem. It's in all of us. And I pray, God, where's that weak spot in me? It's powerful when people talk about their weaknesses. It is powerful. Why the scar that I have on my hand that, that was caused by an injury that led me into a um, six years addiction to painkillers and alcohol, suicide attempt, six overdoses. I don't cover this scar. Why? Because Jesus didn't cover his scars when he came back and he said, look, this was a weakness at one time, but I look at it as a gift because I'm able to reach people that I never thought I'd ever be able to reach. So what's that weakness in you that, that you can look towards God and say, wow, you just opened the door for me to reach people. But how do we look at, we, how do we look at it as a gift? We have to expose it. We have to expose the weakness we have to talk about it. When I was, I'm so glad my wife walked away out from this story. In third grade, I was in love with somebody in, in third grade. I'm not saying her name, because my wife will probably get the, she knows this person. I was in love with this person. And I thought that she liked me. And when I say in love, it was third grade. Oh, okay, I see her in the hallway. I'm not gonna hold her hand or actually acknowledge her, but that's my girlfriend. But I thought that what we would do is, just to get it out in the open, I said, okay, on the count of three, we're going to say who we like. One, two, 
three, and I said her name, and she covered her weakness and said nobody. And I was crushed. But I realized as a church, we need to do that. We need to all come out and say, here's where I struggle. Here's, we need to build authentic relationships. And authentic relationships cannot be built by only showing the good of you. There's some close guys that I have in my life. Some amazing people that know the, the deepest weaknesses that I have. Where I'm able to go to them and say, they say, how was your day today? And I say, it wasn't good. And here's everything that happened. Where I'm able to show this. Paul's weakness. We don't know what the thorn in the side or the weakness was. And if somebody tells you that, that they know, they're lying. It never says it in the Bible. What Paul's weakness was. It's not important. And he's saying, God, he says three times, God, if you help me in this, in this area. And he's praying over and over and over. God, help me in this area. And God says no. He didn't say that he wouldn't cover his sin because sin is covered. All sin is covered through the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not going to take away your weakness. Have you ever prayed over and over and over again for God? To, God, I'll, I'll be a better pastor if you take away my anxiety. God, I'll be a better Christian if you take this away. God, I, I know I can serve you more if you just take this away, Lord. But the more you pray, the more that weakness stays the same. God says no. The, uh, the Second Corinthians in the message version, version, Dave, the first one I gave you, or the second one, can we pull that up again? It's the, um, the message version. It was one of the first scriptures I gave you. And one more. Let's go to nine on that one. I want you to really get this. He said, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad. Wait, you were glad about your weakness. He said, I was glad to let it happen. What? I don't get this. In... Now we can go back. Look at what it says in the a different translation of 2 Corinthians. That first, I gave, I'm so sorry, Dave. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Look at what he, he says in this. It's the, um, the final verse I gave you. There we go. To another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit. In this, he talks about Boasting. I boast about my weakness. And I thought, boasting? When's the last time that we boast about our weakness? And I promise you I'm closing. When's the last time that we boast about our weakness? But then I look to the root translation, and it says to think well of, to speak well of. And he's saying, wait, my, uh, my propensity is to shine light on my strengths and then have my weakness here and be like, no, 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 don't look, don't, don't look. They'll look at my strengths. No, I'm a man of God. I'm a man of God. I don't have anything under here. Don't, and then they walk away. They're like, shine light. You become self-sufficient in your strength and you hide your weakness and say, no, no, no. How do we relate to weakness as a gift? How, do, how does Paul look at it? He says, I started to think well of my weakness. And it, I, I start to hide, and I wonder why that I'm only giving God a side hug. Why I can't fully embrace Jesus as it talks about in that first scripture I gave you. How do we fully embrace Jesus? Because once we're here and we're hiding it, do you know what this turns into as we're hiding it and hiding it? God, I... Don't look at this. Just look at what I've done good for you over here, God. We obsess over this. Some of you are obsessing over where you fall short or your weaknesses or your sin that you don't think that God will take away. And we're supposed to look, not the sin part, we're supposed to look at the weakness and say, how do I take power out of this? 
Do you know how I take power out of it? How I take power out of this is I walk up and I say, you know what, I'm grateful for you. What, what do you mean you're grateful for me? I've almost ruined your life. You have almost ruined your life. But every time that you come around, it drives me closer to the embrace of Jesus. Every time I think of you, and every time I look at that anxiety, sometimes it's so crippling that I can't even talk to anybody about it. I'm drawn closer and I run to Jesus and I'm embraced by Jesus. I don't know when I started talking to a chair like Clint Eastwood. Google it, kids. <laughs> but if I look at this and I, I take the power out of it and I say, thank you. What, what do you mean, thank you? Thank you because every time you come around, I know I need Jesus that much more. Because without you, I would become self-sufficient over here. Without you, I would lose that full embrace. Without you, we, we, you've almost lost everything because of me. Absolutely. But because of you, you're a gift. Because I run into the arms of Jesus. Every time you come around, I run further into his arms. Because without Jesus, you'd ruin everything. Without the grace, embracing grace, you would ruin my life. And so thank you. How do you take power out of it? Thank you to your weakness. That's going to become so foreign for some of you just to say thank you. Thank you for, for the weaknesses that I have in my life where I fall short because it just drives me closer to Jesus. Because what, what you meant for evil... God is using for good. And God, like a father, is holding his arms out. And you push him away and say, hold on, God, I need to work on this. And he's grabbing you and he's saying, you are no match for that weakness. You are no match for that thing that's, that you're struggling with. You are no match. But it's driving me closer to you. And you need me because when you are weak... <laughs> How does it go? When you are weak, then you are strong. Does God help those who help himself? Yeah. But stop helping and start hugging Jesus because he's the only one that can turn this into a gift of saying, come on, son. I know. What I love about this, and I promise you this is seventh close, <laughs> What I love about that story of Luke 15, where he, he's in the pigs, he's cleaning up the pigs and he's feeding the pigs, which was like the worst job for that person. That brought him home. And I could just picture the father saying, those pigs brought you home. That weakness brought you home. So church, embrace your weakness and say, that's the only way that I realize that God's house is the best place for me. Stop helping, church, and just start hugging Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. God, there's times where I just don't know what to say, but you say it for me. I thank you not only for the gifts that you've given me that, that look like strengths, but I just thank you for the weaknesses that no matter how many times I pray for you to take them away, you don't. And I realize that that's a gift because it makes me hit my knees and call on you, Lord, so we can have a full embrace. Let us stop coming to you with these side hugs, holding our gifts in our hand and thinking that's why God wants to hug us. Lord, I pray that we drop everything and realize it's all about embracing you. No matter what we've done or haven't done, it's all about embracing you. And if you have yet to receive that embrace, that hug, that free gift that God has given to those who believe in their heart and speak with their lips, that Jesus is King that came to this earth and lived a sinless life, yet died a sinner's death, my death, our death. But that three days later, he rose again. 
and you're ready to turn from your life, turn from whatever weakness you're in, and run into the arms of Jesus, if that's the first time that you've accepted this, with every eye closed, this is a private moment. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you this week in my office. Who would like that? Yes, I see that hand. 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 Praise God. Yes, I see that hand. Jesus, yes, I see that hand. God, you are so, so good. Whew. God, we love you. And not because of what we do, but because you first loved us. Let's remember that today. Amen. I want you to ask yourself, am I trying to help God more than I am trying to follow Him? There's times where I just need to get away, and those times, by saying those times I need to get away, is every single day where I get away and I'm just quiet with God. I shut everything out, turn off my phone, and I'm just alone with God, and I have this picture of Him hugging me while I hug Him. I'm not working for Him. I just want to hug Him, and I want to be with Him. If we look at our life that way instead of, God, what can I do for you? And then just stop saying, stop saying that and say, God, am I following you? I'm not called to help you. I'm called to follow you. Because in the beginning was God and God alone. So if we realize, God, I'm here just to hug you and embrace you, Paul's accomplishments stood on their own. And he could have bragged all day long about them, but he said, I threw them in the trash because they meant nothing to me compared to me hugging Jesus. If you don't get alone with God, you're going to be spiritually frustrated for the rest of your life. So my challenge for you this week is... Take some time every single day, five minutes, half an hour, whatever it takes. Be alone with God and just say, God, am I following you or am I helping you? And drop the strengths and stop hiding the weaknesses and realize that both can drive us to God. God bless you. Go Hawks. And we have one more song left. Yeah.